evening and welcome to our third online Lenten meditation service. This year for our theme we have been discussing the legacies of Lent, looking at various individuals who had a part to play in Jesus' arrest, trial, and crucifixion. This evening we consider the part that Judas played under the theme, A Fool and His Money. That's the legacy which Judas left behind. Yet, even Judas could find atonement in the blood that Christ shed on the cross. That will be the focus of our meditation. We begin with a response of reading, uh, confessing our sins, and receiving our Lord's forgiveness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. To you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Lead me in your truth. Make, make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Consider my affliction and my trouble, and forgive all my sins. O guard my soul and deliver me. Let me not be put to shame for I take refuge in you. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. For our sake he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We conclude this, that one has died for all Therefore, all have died, and he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Amen.
Last week's Passion reading, we covered the section where Jesus is carried before the Sanhedrin to give testimony there. He was accused of blasphemy and condemned to death. And it also covered that section where Peter sadly denied knowing his Lord three times. And we continue the reading from there. Immediately in the morning, as soon as it was day, the elders of the people, both chief priests and scribes, came together. They took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. They held a consultation with the elders and the scribes and the whole council. They led Jesus into their council, saying, If you are the Christ, tell us. He said to them, If I tell you, you will by no means believe. And if I also ask you, you will by no means answer me or let me go. Hereafter, the Son of Man will sit on the right hand of the power of God. Then they all said, Are you then the Son of God? He said to them, You rightly say that I am. They said, What further testimony do we need? For we have heard it ourselves from his own mouth. And the whole multitude of them arose, bound Jesus, and led him away from Caiaphas to the Praetorium, and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. It was early morning. Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that Jesus had been condemned, was remorseful, and brought back the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priest and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. They said, what is that to us? You see to it. Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. And falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his bowels gushed out. The chief priest took the silver pieces and said, it is not lawful to put them into the treasury because they are the price of blood. They took counsel and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Therefore that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the value of him who was priced, whom they of the children of Israel priced, and gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord directed them. The Jews themselves did not enter into the praetorium lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him, If he were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. Then Pilate said to them, You take him and judge him according to your law. Therefore the Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying by what death he would die. They began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ, a king. Then Pilate entered the praetorium again and called Jesus. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Are you speaking for yourself on this, or did others tell you this about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered and said to him, It is as you say. You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth 
hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? When he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to the chief priest and crowd, I find no fault in this man. I find no fault in him at all. The chief priest accused him of many things. While he was being accused by the chief priest and elders, he answered nothing. Then Pilate asked him again, saying, Do you answer nothing? Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But Jesus still answered nothing. He answered him not one word, so that Pilate the governor marveled greatly. Here ends the Passion reading. We now confess our faith in our Lord Jesus Christ using Martin Luther's explanation to the second article of the Apostles' Creed. I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord. He has redeemed me, a lost and condemned person, purchased and won me from all sin, death, and the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood and with his innocent sufferings and death. He did this that I should be his own, live under him in his kingdom, and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and joy. Just as he is risen from death, lives and reigns to eternity. This is most certainly true. Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and from His Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. One of the most misquoted verses of the Bible is 1 Timothy 6, verse 10. The wrong version of that verse goes like this. Money is the root of all evil. That corruption of what the verse actually says allows for one to self-justify. And it's most of the people that this corrupted version allows to do that, while at the same time pointing the finger of blame and accusation against others. Because here's the reality. Very few people in this world have much wealth, and the rest of us have very little. From there, it's a small jump into what is known as the social gospel, which is no gospel at all. The social gospel teaches people that the true message of Christ is societal reform, which is itself a euphemism for taking, by threat of law, the possessions of the evil rich people. Conveniently, those who fall for the trap of this social gospel don't consider themselves to be the rich and thus not evil. So their money is safe and they can think good of themselves while doing harm to others. But now let's consider the actual verse from 1 Timothy 6.10. It says, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, it is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. By omitting the words for the love of, and then everything that comes after the word evil, those who fall into the camp of the social gospel ironically end up being convicted by the very verse they attempt to hang their hat on. It isn't money. That is the problem. The problem is the heart. It's the love of money, the craving after it. So long as one's heart is consumed with money and the obtainment of, of it, money becomes a person's God. But money makes for a lousy God. 
as the third legacy of Lent that we consider for this meditation demonstrates. And the text that we will use as the basis for this meditation is Matthew chapter 27, verses 3 and 4. Then when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. They said, what is that to us? See to it yourself. So far the word of God. The scriptures warn us that the heart of man is deceitful above all things. And one of the infinite ways this verse is demonstrated to be true is in how even those whose call it is to warn others against covetousness so easily fall victim to the temptation, to the grossest form of covetousness or the love of money. What I'm talking about is people who enter into the holy ministry so easily being captivated and enticed by filthy lucre. And you can see that in the way that one particular church has gone around the world and discovered so many relics, pieces of history from Jesus' arrest and trial and crucifixion. And they use these relics then to coax people to come take a look for a price. A piece of cloth, supposedly, that was laid upon Jesus' lifeless body. A segment of thorns from that crown that was placed upon his head, still with stains of blood. A sliver of wood, supposedly, from the very cross on which Jesus was nailed. And other such things that are placed under glass and lock and key. No, you can't touch them. But for a sum of money, you can see them. P.T. Barnum didn't invent the term, a fool and his money are soon parted. He merely used it to his advantage. But it was the depths of the Roman Catholic Church that took that phrase to its diabolical depths, and still do. Now it's interesting, of all the relics which the Roman Catholic Church is supposedly in possession of, there's one item that is strangely missing. Actually, 30 items. And I'm referring to the 30 pieces of silver which Judas received and subsequently gave back after he betrayed Jesus and noticed that Jesus was going to die. Why is there no glass case containing even one of those silver coins? Why don't people flock to and pay to get a glimpse of a series of ancient Judean coins stacked like poker chips? Could it be that what the Roman Catholic Church is really after is the very thing which such a stack of silver coins already is, namely money. Now, many have offered their opinions as to what Judas was up to in agreeing to betray his Lord and teacher for those 30 pieces of silver. Some suggest that he was attempting to force Jesus' hand into using his special powers to start a revolt and set up his kingdom there in Jerusalem. Others say that he accepted this bribe for the purpose of protecting Jesus, using his own words there in the Garden of Gethsemane to the crowd, to the mob that came to arrest Jesus. This is the one. Take him away and lead him away safely. The scriptures, however, reveal to us that Judas's primary motivation comes down to one of the basis of all sins, 
which is the love of money. He was a keeper of the money bag that Jesus and the disciples carried along on their journeys throughout Judea and Samaria and Galilee, presumably to cover some of their own basic needs, but also to help the poor. But Judas was in the habit of taking money for himself out of the bag, as was revealed when he complained about that, that woman who, who poured some expensive perfume on Jesus' feet. Judas complained about that. That perfume should have been sold and the money delivered to the poor. But then we have this comment. He said that not because he cared about the poor, but because he would steal some of the money. He was concerned about his own pocket. And so in the final analysis, no matter how Judas justified his actions, what it really came down to was the money. That's what he wanted. That's what he trusted in. So he accepted the bribe. He betrayed Jesus with a kiss. But then something happened that Judas wasn't expecting. His conscience started to get the better of him. When he realized that his greed for money meant that Jesus would die, our text tells us that he changed his mind. The Greek word that is used for change of mind here is often, more often translated with a word that we already know. It's the word we know as repentance. And so what it tells us here is that Judas was repentant. Well, that's a good thing, right? Except not all repentance is equal. In 2 Corinthians 7.10, we read that godly sorrow produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Whereas worldly sorrow produces death. Now the question is, which kind of sorrow or repentance did Judas have? Well, we have a clue in the way that Judas went about dealing with his guilty conscience. And that clue is that he didn't go to Jesus begging for forgiveness. No, he went back to the chief priest to give them the money back. He went looking for peace of conscience by thinking that if he returned the silver, all would be better. Oh no, Jesus would still die, but now he wouldn't be culpable. But then the chief priest wouldn't take it. They said, what is our, your concern to us? You go see to it. Take care of your own spiritual problems there, Judas. And so when they wouldn't take it, he threw it at them and ran away. And then when he still didn't obtain the peace he thought he would by getting rid of those 30 pieces of silver, he went out and hanged himself as a final act of desperation to silence the condemnation of God's law written on his heart. So many people have wrongly come to the conclusion on the basis of this tragic event that whoever commits suicide now automatically goes to hell. That is not true. Scripture doesn't tell us that. What Scripture does indicate here through the example of Judas is that leaving this world without repentance and without faith in Jesus as one Savior is what ends up leading a person to hell. In the Gospel of John, Jesus refers to Judas as the son of perdition, another way of saying he was a child of hell. But it is important that we understand what Jesus meant by that statement. Judas wasn't a child of hell because he stole some money, or even a lot of money, on occasion. Money and other valuables often end up in the wrong hands and the wrong pockets. And it's likely that each one of us are guilty of it. That is a sin. It's a sin against God's seventh commandment. And 
really, when you think about it, it's a sin against the first commandment too because it becomes the thing that you love so much in the act of taking what doesn't belong to you. But it's not an unforgivable sin. Also, Judas isn't a child of hell because he betrayed Jesus. All of the disciples, Peter, were guilty of acts just as vile and ugly, even if not as socially crass. But then again, so are we. How often have we betrayed or denied our Lord in front of others by lashing out in anger instead of love and compassion? By refusing to help our neighbor when he needs it? When Jesus told us, that's how you can show that you're my disciples. But still, that's a sin that can be forgiven. And Judas isn't a child of perdition because he receives some money for doing what he did. Again, if that were the case, there would be no hope for anyone, including you and me. Now, Judas is the son of perdition for one reason only. He still thought more highly of that money than he did of his Savior. And what I mean is, that whereas prior to betraying Jesus, Judas did value money so highly that he would take a little here and there out of the money bag for his own selfish purposes, that's bad enough. And then to get more of that filthy lucre and betraying Jesus, okay, that's a bit worse. But it still isn't what landed him in hell. What landed Judas in hell is that even after his sin, and even, even after his conscience tormented him because of it, he thought that the money he so easily, easily obtained through sin would now get him off the hook. In a sense, he was trying to purchase his own redemption. And that's why he took the money back to the chief priest, and when they wouldn't take it, he threw it at him. As if by returning it to its source, he would now be absolved. But when that didn't work either, he so saw no alternative except to kill himself, which means he left this world not trusting in the only one who truly could absolve him, which of course is the one he betrayed, Jesus. And Jesus would have loved to, absol to have absolved Judas. The Apostle Peter, years later, reminds us that you were not, that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Some interesting imagery that, that Peter used there. Silver and gold are natural elements. They don't rot or decay. You know, you can have a silver coin or, or a piece of gold jewelry that will slowly over time wear away into tiny fragments, but they will still be silver and gold. They will still have some value, except on the last day, or your last day on earth. They will be seen to be perishable, because at death or at the judgment, the fool who trusted in his money will most certainly be parted from it. There is only one currency that stands up for your redemption, which is the precious blood of Jesus. And that too is interesting, because blood is one of the most perishable substances known to man. Blood begins to rot as soon as it comes in contact with the air, or as soon as it stagnates. That's why we embalm the dead. But Jesus' blood isn't just any blood. Oh, it's certainly human blood, 
But through the miracle of the incarnation, Jesus' blood is also the blood of the holy, eternal God. Christ's blood, unlike any other, has the power to bring about two most miraculous, gracious results. The forgiveness of sins for all those for whom he died, which is everyone, and then also eternal life to those who are washed in it by faith. His blood shed upon the ground in his suffering and death was filled with the life-giving power of his own righteousness. Crying out to God for your pardon and mine. When he arose, incorruptible and eternal, he proved the eventual, the eventual end of everything which brought about his death, which is the sin of the world that was laid upon him. That wood from the cross would mold and eventually deteriorate. The nails from the, that held Jesus to the cross, they would eventually oxidize, rust, and crumble back into nothingness. And yes, the priests, the soldiers, and Judas's body all decayed in the grave but not Jesus' body. King David writes in the Psalms, you will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. No. What went away from the empty tomb of Jesus is your sin and mine. Jesus' blood was incorruptible, imperishable. And it washed away every last sin that we've ever committed. Sadly, Judas found out the hard way, in fact, the hardest of ways, that a fool and his money are soon parted. He learned that money was deceptive, not just in what he thought he would gain by stealing it, but also by what he thought he would gain by giving it back. He wished it never happened. He wished he had never betrayed Jesus, that Jesus had never been arrested and condemned to die. But by faith in the worth of Jesus' precious blood, you and I can live and die happy that it did. Amen.
Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. 